Calling civil case 092292, Kristen Perry et al. versus Arnold Schwarzenegger et al. Can I get appearances on the plaintiff's side, please? Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore B. Olson, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Mr. Olson. <coughs> Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore Boutrous, also for the plaintiffs, also from Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. Mr. Boutrous, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. David Boys of Boys, Schiller, and Flexner, also for the plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Christopher Dusseau of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, also on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Jeremy Goldman from Boys, Schiller, and Flexner, on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Steve Holtzman, also Boys, Schiller, and Flexner for the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. City Attorney Dennis Herrera for Plaintiff Intervenor City and County of San Francisco. Good morning. Good morning, Chief Judge Walker, Trez M. Stewart, uh, Chief Deputy City Attorney for Plaintiff Intervenor City and County of San Francisco. Good morning, Mr. Chief Judge. Charles Cooper, Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Cooper, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. David Thompson of Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Mr. Thompson, good morning. Walker, Howard Nielsen, also of Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. Nicole Moss with Cooper and Kirk for Defendant Intervenors. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Peter Patterson, also from Cooper and Kirk for the Defendant Intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. James Campbell of the Alliance Defense Fund on behalf of the Defendant Intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. Brian Rahm. For the defendant intervenors on um, behalf of Alliance Defense Fund. Morning. Morning, Your Honor. Andrew Stroud, Minnemeyer, Glassman, and Stroud on behalf of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in his official capacity and on behalf of the other administration defendants. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Tamar Pactor on behalf of the California Attorney General. Good morning, Your Honor. Deputy Solicitor General Gordon Burns on behalf of the defense. Deputy Solicitor General Gordon Burns on behalf of Attorney General Brown. On behalf of? General Brown. Very well. Good morning, Your Honor. Claude Colm, Deputy County Counsel on behalf of Defendant Patrick O'Connell, the Alameda County Clerk Recorder. Good morning, Your Honor. Manuel Martinez, also for Defendant Patrick O'Connell, Clerk Recorder for County of Alameda. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Judy Whitehurst with the Los Angeles County Counsel's Office on behalf of Dean C. Logan, the Los Angeles County Registrar and Recorder County Clerk. Good morning. Any other appearances? Terry Thompson on behalf of uh, defendant intervener Hakshing William Tam. William Tam. Good morning. Any others? Perhaps when we uh, get into the next day of trial, we can move this process of putting appearances in somewhat more expeditiously. I think it's particularly helpful when there are lots of lawyers who may not be speaking in the case that uh, they get to enter their appearances, but uh, maybe as we move, move along we can uh, expedite that. Now I trust that you all have had a quiet and restful few days since we were together on Wednesday. Um, I can assure you I have. <laughs> now you probably know we received this morning a, 
an order <coughs> from the Supreme Court which has stayed the transmission of any audio or visual uh, images uh, of this case until at least 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday the uh, 13th. So the issue that consumed much of our discussion on Wednesday and that I gather has uh, consumed much of your time in the last few days is, I think, resolved for the moment, and we can just uh, leave it in place. It, it's, it clears the, clears the air. There certainly are a good many issues that surround this, and uh, we'll see what uh, the guidance the Supreme Court uh, can provide us uh, on this issue. Uh, there are many issues in play, as I'm sure you recognize, the respective role of the Judicial Conference of the United States and the uh, various uh, judicial councils of the circuits. Uh, that, I'm sure, is uh, an issue that is being considered by uh, the justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, but I do want to clarify a, a couple of points uh, with reference uh, to this issue. What uh, the court has contemplated and what the Ninth Circuit pilot project contemplates uh, is a posting on the Northern District of California website. It is not uh, a Google YouTube uh, posting that uh, may be commonly understood. Uh, rather, that service is under consideration as a conduit for posting an audio and visual feed pursuant to a contract that the government has with that service. And you may very well have observed the um, White House website that uh, is accessible through the YouTube Google service. Uh, if you've not observed it, uh, you should certainly do so. It's completely in keeping with the um, appropriateness of presidential uh, statements and information being supplied by uh, the president uh, to the public. And so that service would be used here in exactly or very much the same, uh, the same manner. I also want to report uh, with reference to the changes in the local rules. And to some degree, I'm responsible for some confusion over this. This is the change to Local, local Rule 77-3. That was adopted at a court meeting, a special court meeting, not held for the purpose of considering an amendment to Rule 77-3, but for another purpose. But it was timely because it occurred a few days after the Ninth Circuit adopted the pilot project uh, that you're familiar with. And the court at that special meeting, unanimously adopted the change to Local Rule 77-3, and did so without comment, without a comment period, because it was a conforming amendment to Ninth Circuit policy. And in addition, of course, uh, both the Ninth Circuit Council and this court had very much in mind the possibility of an audio and visual uh, transmission uh, of this case pursuant to that uh, pilot project. Uh, so that uh, amendment was made pursuant to the uh, urgency provision, which is permitted under uh, Title 28. And it was suggested that thereafter, comments uh, should be uh, sought and elicited to the, uh, to the rule. We have frequently done that, in the, perhaps not frequently, we have done that in the past where a local rule has been adopted either on some urgent basis or some other basis thought to be appropriate, and then comments solicited after the amendment. And that was done here. Unfortunately, I did not ask the clerk who <coughs> posted the announcement to uh, review that announcement with me, and so uh, the word proposed change uh, did get posted on the website. And in fact, the change in the local rule was not a proposed change at all, but rather was 
a rule uh, that was adopted. Nonetheless, we have received a very substantial number of comments in response to that change. Uh, as, of, as of Friday, 5 p.m. Friday, uh, we had received 138,574 responses or comments. Now, a good many of those comments, of course, related simply to the transmission of this case and did not specifically address uh, the rule change. Some did specifically address the rule change, and some, of course, mentioned both. But I think it's fair to say that those that favored coverage of this particular case implicitly uh, also uh, favored the rule change, which would make uh, an audio-visual transmission of this case possible. And if these results are any indication of where sentiment lies on this issue, uh, it's overwhelmingly in favor of the rule change and uh, the dissemination of uh, this particular proceeding uh, by some means uh, through the Internet. And the numbers, frankly, are 138,542 in favor and 32 opposed. <laughs> so I think the, uh, at least the returns are clear uh, in this case. And we received a very thoughtful submission by the Federal Bar Association, which at some point or other I would like to make uh, part of the record, simply to complete uh, the record with respect uh, to this matter. Now, there are some continuing uh, technical issues that attend the possible transmission of these proceedings over the Internet. Chief Judge, Chief Judge Kaczynski and uh, the circuit executive Kathy Ketterson worked very hard over the weekend with the court's uh, technical staff to resolve those issues. Uh, one of the emails that I received on this subject, actually two of the emails that I received, one from Chief Judge Kaczynski and one from uh, Ms. Katterson were dated Sunday morning, shortly after midnight. So they worked very hard and very diligently along with the court staff to try to resolve these issues. Where matters stand in that regard, I don't know. I've not uh, involved myself in that uh, part of the um, activity. Rather, to the extent I've devoted myself to this case over the weekend, it's reading your briefs and proposed findings of fact and other matters, which I think are probably more appropriate for me to spend time on. Now, with that, I don't think at this point we have anything more that we need or should say on this particular subject, unless any of the parties have something that he or she wishes to add. I do think uh, what uh, we have gone through in this uh, case in the last few days has been very helpful, very helpful indeed. The issue of the public's right to access court proceedings is an important one. I think it's highly unfortunate that the judicial conference uh, and the courts have not uh, dealt with this issue in the past, um, have not in a considered and thoughtful fashion work through the issues. Uh, the briefs that you filed in the Court of Appeals and in the Supreme Court uh, deal with those issues, and that's true of both sides. Certainly the concerns that the proponents have raised here are concerns that should be considered, need to be considered, and uh, in due course should be given uh, thorough consideration. But I think in this day and age, with the technology that's available and the importance of the public's right to access judicial proceedings, it's very important that we in the federal judiciary work to achieve that access consistent with the means that are presently available to do that. And uh, I would <coughs> commend you for the efforts that you've made in bringing these issues forward, and I'm hopeful that this experience will have uh, brought these issues to the fore and maybe 
finally, after some 20 years, we'll get some uh, sensible movement forward. Um, now, Mr. Boutrous. I address one issue. Um, since the stay is temporary and the court, Supreme Court is going to be considering these issues, um, and given the importance of the issues in this case, we would request that the court permit recording and preservation of the proceedings today and through Wednesday. Um, I've heard, having heard Mr. Cooper argue on many occasions, I can't imagine why he wouldn't want his opening statement preserved for the record <laughs> so the public can hear what he has to say. And, and same goes for Mr. Olson. And um, given the, the fact that this is a temporary stay and the stay order does not mention anything about restricting the ability of the court to capture the images on the cameras and preserve them in the event the stay is lifted and Judge Kaczynski issues his order, um, we think that would be a, a good solution. Uh, so then the, the, the materials could be posted when those, uh, those things happen. Well, that's very much of a possibility as presently um, matters stand, the only transmission of these proceedings is to the overflow courtroom in this courthouse. Any transmission beyond that uh, is not permitted pending uh, some further order of the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals. And uh, indeed, Chief Judge Kaczynski, who would uh, be directing the pilot project. Uh, I think your request is a fair one, but uh, in the event that uh, there is no <coughs> recording permitted uh, after the issue is finally settled. If a recording is made, some disposition of that recording would have to be uh, dealt with, and perhaps this is a matter that we can deal with after uh, we learn what the rule is going to be in this case. I would prefer to, to defer it until then. That's what I would propose, Your Honor. That, that way, simply recording it now, and then, then the court can grapple with that issue when, when we find out what happens on Wednesday. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Cooper. Your Honor, I, I very much uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Boutros's desire to ensure that my words are uh, memorialized. <laughs> uh, but I, but I, I do object to his proposal. I, I don't believe that it's in keeping with, although at least as I read the, uh, the court's order, and I only had a moment to do so, uh, I don't believe it specifically addresses this issue, but I don't think it's consistent with the spirit of that, of that order. Uh, and so I just want to make uh, clear our, our objection to that proposal. Thank you. Very well. Well, your objection is noted. Well, we uh, have opening statements to make, and uh, are there any preliminary matters that we should address before we turn to the opening statements? For the plaintiffs, for the defendants, for the interveners? None. We're ready to proceed when Your Honor is ready. Very well. Mr. Cooper? I have a preliminary evidentiary matter I'd like to put on the record for purposes of preserving it, and I think perhaps that should happen after the opening statements and when we get into the presentation of evidence, but I wanted to alert you to that. And what is that, sir? It, it, it is to uh, reiterate, again, for uh, purposes of preserving our objection to any uh, evidentiary presentation going to the intent and purpose of the voters in Proposition 8. We have, as you know, relied from the outset on the Sasso case and its statement that the question of motivation of a, for a referendum, apart from consideration of its effects, is not an appropriate one for judicial inquiry. Now, we know we've, we've lost this issue here, but I, I do want to put this on the, on the record for purposes of preserving it solely. And I know that uh, from, uh, from uh, if it's uh, that uh, plaintiff's counsel have uh, provided to us that that in the opening witnesses uh, it appears they plan to put this kind of evidence on things such as the ads used in connection with the uh, yes on eight uh, campaign and rather th and so uh, I, I simply want to have a continuing objection if I may uh, to all of that evidence so that I needn't and my colleagues needn't pop up every time 
uh, such information is solicited as it will be throughout the trial. So that's my, that's my only purpose. And if I can have that continuing objection for the purpose of preserving it, uh, I, I, I am satisfied. Very well. Well, you should be satisfied. I think your record is quite clear. You've made it quite clear. And uh, so thank you. Uh, eat on that understanding. Very well. Mr. Olson, you're going to make the opening statement for the plaintiffs. Thank you, Your Honor. This case is about marriage and equality. Plaintiffs are being denied both the right to marry and the right to equality under the law. The Supreme Court of the United States has repeatedly described the right to marriage as one of the most vital personal rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness, a basic civil right, a component of the constitutional rights to liberty, privacy, association, and intimate choice, an expression of emotional support and public commitment, the exercise of spiritual unity, and a fulfillment of oneself. In short, in the words of the highest court in the land, marriage is the most important relation in life and of fundamental importance for all individuals. Now, does the right to marry as secured by the Constitution mean the right to have a marriage license issued by the state? Well, to the extent um, that the state asserts the right to regulate marriage and it utilizes the form of a license to do so, I would think that would follow. Why? I'm not sure I understand the import of the question because, it, as I said, it seems to me that if there is a right to marry in the Constitution, and the court upholds the right to the individuals that we're representing to marry. Well, what you're saying is that that, that right presumes that the state has a duty to issue marriage licenses. Well, it would have an issue, a, a duty to issue the mar a marriage license where it would constitutionally require it under the Constitution, um, and, and that would be coextensive with the constitutional right itself, it is certainly appropriate. Could the state get out of the marriage license business? Yes, I believe it could. Um, it is certainly appropriate, I was about to say, uh, Chief Judge Walker, that there may be aspects of the marital status that the state would be perfectly appropriate in considering to regulate, uh, age of individuals or something like that, um, uh, or the process by which it's done, or some registration requirement or something like that. We're not involved in this case with those types of regulatory activities, but, uh, but the state, it seems to me, could get out of the business of licensing marriage. Um, that wouldn't be required by the Constitution. What the Supreme Court has talked about is the relationship itself, marriage, and that relationship has consistently throughout history been regulated by the states through the process of marriage licenses. As the witnesses uh, in this case will elaborate with respect to that point, the right to marriage itself, marriage is central to life in America. It promotes mental, physical, and emotional health and the economic strength and stability of those who enter into a marital union. It is the building block of family, neighborhood, and community in our society. The California Supreme Court has declared, excuse me, has declared that the right to marry is of central importance to an individual's opportunity to live a happy, meaningful, and satisfying life as a full member of society. Proposition 8 ended the dream of marriage, the most important relation in life for the plaintiffs and hundreds of thousands of Californians. In May of 2008, the California Supreme Court concluded that under this state's constitution, the right to marry a person of one's choice extended to all individuals, 
regardless of sexual orientation and was available equally to same-sex and opposite-sex couples. In November of 2008, a few months later, the voters of California responded to that decision with Proposition 8, amending the state's constitution and on the basis of sexual orientation and sex, slammed the door to marriage to gay and lesbian citizens. The plaintiffs are two loving couples, American citizens, entitled to equality and due process under our Constitution. They are in deeply committed, intimate, and long-standing relationships. I gather the, the evidence will be that the plaintiffs are not registered domestic partners? In, in, uh, uh, one, what is the evidence on that? Two, uh, one couple is. And, and we will be, in fact, the first four witnesses in the case will be the four plaintiffs, and we will ask them to describe their relationship with one another, the history of that relationship, and explore that very subject. And what disabilities do they operate under as domestic partners as opposed to marital partners? Well, they will describe in considerable detail, Chief Judge Walker, what it means to be married to them, to their families, to their children, what it is like in the workplace, what it is like when they travel, what it is like when they go to a doctor's office, the difference between marriage and domestic oh, partnership. Are those differences of a legal nature, that is, are these differences, to the extent there is some inferior status associated with domestic partnership, is that a product of state action or is that simply societal acceptance? Well, I think the two are so closely interwoven they cannot be extracted because what the state has done has given a sanction to a formal relationship which is part of our culture and part of society. The state is labeling an individual relationship as something called a domestic partnership which has nothing to do with love. Uh, and it has, a, it has labeled a separate relationship which the proponents have described in papers filed with this court as a unique and special relationship reserved for opposite sex couples. It means something to them, it means something to society, and it means something to the state of California. California has put people into categories, and I was going to say a few, in a few moments well, later... Does Proposition 8 classify people? It, it does. It doesn't classify individuals, does it? It simply mm -hmm. restricts marriage to opposite sex couples. And when it does so, it classifies people into separate categories. And I will point out later in my statement um, that there are now four categories of Californians under, in connection with the status of marriage. And that matters a great deal. The evidence will show from the plaintiffs and from the experts that will be presented to this court what it means to be married, what it means to have the state sanction your relationship to give its official approval, which is one of the reasons why Proposition 8 was passed and one of the reasons why it's being so defended so vigorously by the proponents of Proposition 8 because they want that status to remain special and reserved to opposite-sex couples and to be denied to same-sex couples because there is a judgment being made, and it's expressed by what California has done, that this is something different, separate, unequal, and less advantageous. Domestic partnerships are not limited to same-sex couples, correct? I think that's correct. So it's possible that opposite-sex couples could form a domestic partnership and register under California law. I haven't spent a great deal of time studying that, but I suspect Your Honor has, and, and um, I'm don't, not... Don't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe that's true. I, I, I don't imagine why, the, why it's... I know nothing that would suggest that it would be exclusive to same-sex couples. So where's the discrimination here? If, for example, California were to get out of the marriage business and simply classify everybody as a domestic partner, wouldn't that solve your problem? If California um, allowed people to marry without a license, which is what I think is part of the import of your 
your suggestion and said that the only thing we're re regulating is something called domestic partnership and, and everybody can do that. Yes, that might mean that California is treating people equally and people can enter into relationships that they call marriage without the sanction of the state, the approval of the state, all of the things that goes with the government taking a position on relationships based upon sex or sexual orientation. That may solve the problem. That will never happen. The people of California, I just am reasonably confident in predicting will not get out of the business of marriage. As I said, uh, on November 8, the voters of California slammed the door on marriage to gay and lesbian citizens. Why won't they get out of the marriage business? Why won't Why they? Won't I, the I, I, California I, get out of the marriage business? Wouldn't I, it, that I, would solve this problem, wouldn't it? I think that politically it would not happen. Now, now I'm not offering myself as, as an a political expert, expert? <laughs> <laughs> on political science or what the people the voters do because I've been wrong again and again um, I'm just t handed a note and I don't know um, I haven't researched this that only opposite sex couples over 62 years old can receive the domestic partnership treatment I I have not researched this and I and I advance it as um, on the basis of um, someone on our team obviously has. Um, Good authority, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, do not, I do not offer myself as an expert on what the voters of this state or any other state will do. But, I, but, but from what I do know, um, of ha after having lived in California a long time um, and studied the issue of relationship uh, and marriage in connection with this case, I suspect that the people of the state of California are not going to want to abandon the relationship which the proponents of Proposition 8 spend enormous amount of resources describing as a special relationship that means a great deal to people and is important and is so important that it must be preserved for opposite sex couples and withheld from same sex couples. Well, but the proponents argue that marriage has never been extended to same-sex couples in the past, and so we're simply preserving a tradition that is long established and that is indeed implicit in the very concept of marriage. Yes, and we, w we, will, we will offer evidence about the relationship, about what the courts of the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court of this state and what uh, the experts who have studied marriage have said about that. One of the points that I was going to make, and I will, will make it, is that there have been restrictions on marriage in the past based upon biases towards people of a different race. Based upon sex, there have been restrictions on marriage that treated women unequally in the relationship. That was always the way it was for a while. Um, that was always the way it was in certain states that certain people of certain races or ethnicity. California treated people of an Asian descent differently with respect to marriage. There was What's the evidence going to show that has happened here to raise the right to marry to such a level that now the marriage of same-sex couples is entitled to equal protection and due process protection? What, right. what are the it facts is, going to show? Well, the facts are going to show that the relationship that what the Supreme Court has talked about is in the relationship of marriage is the right of an individual to privacy, association, liberty, intim intimate relationships, and so forth. And that, that in, in, what the Supreme Court's talked about in terms of what the relationship means isn't limited to people of opposite sex. What an individual gets out of the relationship of marriage, and this is what the evidence will show from experts um, at leading institutions from, um, from the United States and in the world, that, that it's the relationship between the individual in the marriage um, situation that is valuable, and the withholding of it doesn't make sense from certain classes of individuals. But what's the change that has occurred to elevate this right or to change the understanding of this right? What are, what are Cal the facts going to Well, be? California, as I said a few moments ago, in May of 2008, 
said that opposite same-sex couples have the same right to marry under the California Constitution as opposite-sex couples. What the California Supreme Court did was pronounce what the California Constitution permitted. So that what California Supreme Court was saying is what the right was, and it included the right of same-sex couples to marry. I'm not getting at what the California Supreme Court said. I'm getting at what the evidence here is going to show. The evidence, the evidence here is going to show the same sort of thing that the California Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court has considered when it is considered marriage. And you ask what changed? What changed? What changed was the change was November of 2008 when Proposition 8 was passed because the California Proposition California Constitution up to that point, based upon the decision of the California Supreme Court in May, permitted people of the same sex to marry. What changed was Proposition 8, which isolated gay and men and lesbian uh, individuals and said, you're different. We're going to withhold and take away that right from you. Um, you now, what's the evidence you're going to show that Proposition 8 was motivated by an intent to discriminate against gays and lesbians? The evidence. What's the evidence? The, ev the evidence will, in the first place, um, the, ad uh, the advertising, the ballot proposition, um, this, the, the um, Proposition 8 itself, official title of the ballot measure, in a sense, said it all, eliminates right of same-sex couples to marry. Now, discrimination is, can, can take Various wasn't form. that a um, formulation devised by the Attorney General? I think that's, that's not only the official title of the statute, it's the way it was characterized. It was the way it was characterized in the official um, ballot um, measure information that's sent to every voter in the state, eliminate the right of same-sex couples to marry. There's no question, um, Your Honor, that what Proposition 8 did and was intended to do was to take away a right of same-sex couples to be in the marital relationship and to um, confine them to domestic partnerships or some other relationship. It put them in a different category. Now that's discrimination. We could argue and there will be um, some discussion by the experts and the plaintiffs themselves about what they heard and what they saw during the campaign for Proposition 8 and how that made them feel with respect to the things that were being said about them and about their relationship. I'm sure that the evidence is, is, would show no matter who put the evidence on that individual voters may have been motivated differently one way or the other. They, they may have had religious convictions, they may have had uh, other kinds of, the, the same kind of sentiments towards um, uh, gay men and lesbian women that have motivated um, people to uh, prevent uh, such individuals from serving in the United States government, from serving in the armed forces, from being prosecuted criminally. It may have been all, all kinds of range of emotions, but discrimination isn't in any doubt. Well, but moral disapproval has never been a basis to find an enactment unconstitutional, has it? Um, uh, local ordinance or state law pre uh, preventing or prohibiting the sale of intoxicating liquors would not be invalid because it reflects the moral values of a community. Well, moral values of a community, if they take into consideration, as you used the phrase in your very first order in this case, immutable characteristics, um, may have constitutional dimension. Um, the, the discrimination against people on the basis of race, the history, history of the United States is, is full of moral condemnation of other people because of their race, their sex, um, um, or their ethnicity. Moral condemnation is a very, very broad concept. And the idea that someone's different and therefore shouldn't be able in California to own a laundry is something that the United States Supreme Court rejected. The Supreme Court of the United States in Lawrence versus Texas addressed that very point. The argument was by the state of Texas is, of course, we can prohibit 
that private intimate relationship between individuals of the same sex because of moral disapproval. That was the basis advanced in the United States Supreme Court with respect to uh, the conduct that was at issue there. Kinds of laws are based upon some moral uh, understanding that is commonly and widely shared. Uh, that doesn't make the enactment or the law invalid, does it? No. But it does when it has to do with a person's race, a person's sex, a person's ethnicity. I would su submit if it was based upon a person's religion and, if, and, and Lawrence versus Texas and Romer versus Colorado stand for the proposition that if that moral disapproval or whatever kind of disapproval it is, because it is disapproval when you're putting somebody in a different box, as at the California Supreme Court said, denying this right to Californians made them second-class citizens. So there's moral disapproval and disapproval, but when it's based upon certain characteristics of the individual, then it cannot constitutionally be done in the United States of America under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The, as I said just a moment ago, the California Supreme Court specifically addressed this and said that relegating these individuals, uh, preventing them from marrying a same-sex partner, relegates those individuals, to use the phrase of the California Supreme Court, to second-class citizenship and tells their families and them and their neighbors and their co-workers that their love and their desire for a sanctioned marital partnership is not worthy of recognition. During the trial, you've asked about the evidence, plaintiffs and leading experts in the fields of history, psychology, economics, and political science will prove these three basic fundamental points that we will be addressing during the course of this trial. Marriage, that relationship, culturally and as sanctioned by the state, is vitally important in American society. Secondly, by denying gay men and lesbians the right to marry, Proposition 8 works a grievous harm on the plaintiffs and other gay men and lesbians throughout California and adds yet another chapter. We will talk about the chapters in American and California history of, to the long history of discrimination these individuals have suffered at the hands of their fellow citizens and at the hands of their government. And thirdly, that Proposition 8 perpetrates this irreparable, immeasurable, discriminatory harm for no good, no good reason. Now, with respect to the first point, marriage, the experts, the witnesses that we will present in the next few days um, are from leading experts representing the finest academies in the United States and throughout the world who will say what the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of California has already said about the importance of marriage in society, the significant benefits that that relationship between two individuals confers on couples, their families, and the community. Proponents really cannot dispute these basic facts about the value and integrity and importance of marriage. And same-sex couples are permitted to enter this uh, institution, this esteemed institution of marriage. Doesn't that change the institution? No, Your Honor, and I'm going to come to that. The, the, it will not damage the relationship of opposite sex couples to have the opportunity to marry. It won't change the institution. What it will fulfill the institution. The history is I, I, a point I was just about to make of marriage has evolved. It has changed to shed irrational, unwarranted, and discriminatory restrictions and limitations that reflected the biases and prejudices and stereotypes of the past. Marriage laws that disadvantage women or people of a disfavored race or ethnicity have been eliminated. Some of those changes have come from court decisions and some of those changes have come from legislative changes. But those changes have not harmed the institution of marriage. They have not harmed the institution of marriage. The elimination of discriminatory restrictions. The evidence on, going to, is the evidence going to show that marriage as an institution is stronger now than it was when it had these uh, limitations? Yes. 
the evidence will show and the witnesses will testify that when you discriminate against someone because they're Chinese with respect to the relationship of marriage, or when you discriminate against someone on the basis of their race in the institution of marriage, that is wrong and that weakens the institution of what marriage. What evidence is the, that? The President of the United States, today's President of the United States, if, if his mother and father had tried to get married in Virginia the, before the time he was born, it would have been against the law. That weakens our moral fiber in this country. It weakens our respect for the Constitution. And in my judgment, and I think in the judgment of the experts, and certainly it's in the judgment of the United States Supreme Court in Loving versus Virginia, it weakened the institution of marriage to have those types of restrictions. It certainly weakened the institution of marriage when women were treated differently in the marital relationship. The taking away of those restrictions allowed women and men to have an equal relationship, and California was among the leaders um, in removing some of those distinctions, both legislatively and through court decisions. The harm that is done is, is significant. Um, Proposition 8 harmed individuals in this state who are citizens Proposition 8, as I said, had a simple, straightforward purpose. Now, evil purpose, we're not talking about evil purpose or anything else. We're talking about a purpose to eliminate a right that some people had under the California Constitution. Well, they hadn't had that right very long. Though, had they, had, they had, they had, they had. Doesn't had, that make some difference? If we're talking it, about a long established right, it would be one thing. But this is a right which was established by the California Supreme Court mere months prior to the uh, decision in the Strauss case. The, the, when the California, the California Supreme Court didn't create the right, the California Supreme Court recognized the right in the California Constitution. And when the United States Supreme Court determines that something violates the First Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, it is recognizing and deciding, declaring, in the words of Marbury versus Madison, what the law is. So the fact that the California Supreme Court finally got around in May of 2008. Some to, people find these discoveries surprising, of course. Well, we are uh, always constantly surprised by education. And one of the things that I think this trial will do and I hope that the Supreme Court allows the American people to see it, because it will be an education. Attitudes change when people are educated. And when they learn, if the American people could see what you're going to see from the plaintiffs themselves, what that discrimination does to them every day, and what it does to their families and to their relationships when they go somewhere and they can't introduce the person that they love as their spouse. They have to expl explain what in the world a domestic partnership is. What that does, does maybe surprise some people, surprise in the sense that it opens people's minds to the damage that we're doing when we discriminate on this basis. Now, if Proposition 8 is unconstitutional, can the Defense of Marriage Act be constitutional? I, we have not specifically addressed that, and your decision in this case, or the Supreme Court's decision in, in this case, will, will certainly have an impact on that. Part of what is, is going to be before you, and we'll have to all work this through, is that one of the things that distinguishes what we have in California is something that was very similar to the situation in Romer versus Colorado, where an existing constitutional right um, and a, a, was taken away, or existing rights were taken away by an amendment to the Constitution. So what may be decided in this case may, necess may not necessarily go so broad as to take down or, or implicitly take down the Defense of Marriage statute. I think at the end of the day that that discrimination, my personal opinion, and I have, re have researched this, is that that is unconstitutional as well. And the discrimination 
of individuals on this basis under our Constitution based upon characteristics of individuals that they do not choose to have, like race or sex or ethnicity, is unconstitutional. This case, at the end of the day, may not lead you there, but the idea that something is, that the taking away of the right to marriage is okay, no big deal, because you have a right to domestic partnership is a cruel fiction. As I said, the plaintiffs will describe the harm that they suffer every day because they're prevented from marrying. They will describe, and experts will describe, but there's no better voice to express it than the people themselves, how demeaning and insulting it can be that they are still free to marry as long as they marry someone of the opposite sex, not the person that they love, not the person who is their choice. And the evidence will demonstrate that relegating gay men and lesbians to domestic partnerships is to inflict upon them badges of inferiority that forever stigmatize their loving relationships as different, separate, unequal, and less worthy, something akin to a commercial venture. That's what a domestic partnership looks like, sounds like, feels like, not a loving union. Indeed, the proponents of Proposition 8 acknowledge that domestic partnerships aren't the same as traditional marriage. They proudly proclaim in the papers they filed with this court, and we don't disagree with this, that proposi under Proposition 8, the in their words, the unique and highly favorable imprimatur by the state of marriage is reserved to opposite sex unions. That's something special, that's something important, that's something that's unique, and it's highly favorable, and it's reserved to people of the opposite sex uh, when they wish to marry. This government-sponsored societal stigmatization causes grave, the experts will tell us, grave psychological and physical harms to gay men and lesbians and their families, and it increases the likelihood, because we're branding them as different, as inferior, and as less worthy, and their relationships as less worthy of recognition, it increases the likelihood that they will experience discrimination and harassment. It causes immeasurable harm. And sadly, to come back to a point that you were making, it is only the most recent chapter in our nation's history, long and painful, of discrimination and prejudice against gay and lesbian individuals. They have been classified in this nation as degenerates, targeted by police, harassed in the workplace, censored, demonized, fired from government jobs. It wasn't very many years ago that the President of the United States said that people who were homosexuals could be fired, from, or should be fired from their government jobs excluded from our armed forces, arrested for their private sexual conduct, and repeatedly stripped of their fundamental rights by popular vote. Progress, Your Honor, has occurred, but the roots of discrimination run deep, and their impacts spread widely. And Proposition 8 perpetuates that discrimination, and it does so for no good reason. It singles out, Proposition 8 singles out gay and lesbian individuals alone for exclusion from the institution of marriage. In California, even convicted murderers and child abusers enjoy the freedom to marry. As the evidence clearly establishes, this discrimination has been placed in California's constitution even though its victims, the victims of this discrimination, are and always have been fully contributing members of our society. Are not. Discrimination based on sex and discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, different? They are, they can be different. In this case, they are both, both types of discrimination is involved. There is no question that there's discrimination based upon sexual orientation. Uh, but there also, it's also sex because the state is telling me if I wish to marry the person that I love, another decent citizen of California, I can marry that person provided the sex of that person is right. The state has decided that, that marriage based upon sex is okay, that it will be recognized. This relationship 
based upon sex won't. It's sexual orientation and it is sex. Um, and this is this, this, this proposition excludes gay men and lesbians from the institution of marriage even though that sexual orientation to which you referred, like race, sex, and ethnicity, eth ethnicity is a fundamental aspect of their identity that they did not choose for themselves, and as the California Supreme Court found, is highly resistant to change. The state of California, the state of California, who has this proposition in its constitution has no justification, none, for the decision to eliminate the fundamental right to marry for a segment of its citizens. It offers no defense, and its chief legal officer, the Attorney General of California, admits that none exists, that this is unconstitutional. And the evidence will show that each of the rationalizations for Proposition 8 invented, invented by its proponents is without merit. They mention procreation, and procreation cannot be a justification inasmuch as Proposition 8 permits marriage by persons who are unable or who have no intention or no ability whatsoever to have children or produce children. Indeed, the institution of marriage, civil marriage in this country, has never been restricted or tied to the procreative activity of those who enter into it. Proposition 8 also has no rational relationship to the parenting of children, although this is what the proponents are now saying, because same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples are equally, in California, permitted to have and raise children in this state. The evidence in this case from the experts will demonstrate that gay and lesbian individuals are every bit as capable of being loving, caring, and effective parents as heterosexuals. The quality of a parent is not measured by gender, but by the content of the heart. And two of our plaintiffs are raising four children, and they will discuss that relationship. And there is no doubt in my mind that it will demonstrate, that evidence will demonstrate, that passion that they have for their family and the raising of their children cannot be characterized as insufficient or inadequate in, or inferior in any way. And as for, as for protecting the point you made earlier, traditional marriage, our opponents, you asked this question, our opponents don't know how permitting gay and lesbian couples to marry would harm the marriage of opposite sex couples. And needless to say, guesswork speculation about what might happen or what might not happen is an inadequate justification for discrimination. But the evidence affirmatively will show that permitting loving, deeply committed couples like the plaintiffs to marry has no impact whatsoever to address your question upon the marital relationship of others. When voters in California were urged, and this will come back to another point, to enact Proposition 8, they were encouraged to believe that unless Proposition 8 was enacted, anti-gay religious institutions would be closed, gay activists would overwhelm the will of heterosexual people in California, and that children would be taught that it was acceptable for gay and lesbians to marry. Parents were urged to protect our children from that presumably pernicious point of view that it was acceptable for a gay person to marry another gay person. At the end of the day, whatever the motives of, the, whatever the motives of its proponents, Proposition 8 enacted, and this goes back to yet another one of your points, enacted an utterly irrational regime to govern entitlement to the fundamental right to marry consisting of four separate and distinct classes of citizens. First, heterosexuals, including convicted criminals, substance abusers, and sex offenders who are permitted to marry, and their marriage is recognized in California. Second, 18,000 same-sex couples married between June and November of 2008 are allowed to remain married, but if they divorce or if they lose their spouse by widowhood, 
they can't remarry. And third, thousands of same-sex couples as of the first of the year who are married in certain other states prior to November of 2008, those marriages are now valid and recognized in California. People who were married someplace else and came to California, their marriage are recognized. But fourth, the fourth category are the people that we represent, the plaintiffs, and hundreds of thousands of other California same-sex couples who are prohibited by Proposition 8 from marrying. At the end of the day, there is no rational justification for this unique pattern of discrimination. Proposition 8 and this irrational pattern of category, category, category. Mr. Cooper frequently makes the point that this is really a subject from which the courts should abstain, should not involve themselves. That uh, this is an issue that's being played out through the political process. We've seen it play out uh, in the last uh, few months in the political process. Um, why shouldn't the courts just stand back and let this develop politically? Because that is why we have courts. And that is why we have a Constitution. That is why we have the 14th Amendment. When individuals who may not be the most popular people, who are different than we are, are treated differently under the Constitution, when they are excluded from our schools, or when they're put in separate schools, or when they're not allowed to marry because the color of the skin of the partner of their choice is different they come to the courts. And time after time, the courts have addressed these issues. And time after time, the courts have addressed those issues, notwithstanding that very, very point. Leave it to the political process. We wouldn't need a constitution if we left everything to the political process. But if we left everything to the political process, the majority would always prevail, which is a great thing about democracy, but it's not so good if you're a minority or if you're a disfavored minority or you're new or you're different. And that's what happens here. What Proposition 8 does is label gay and lesbian persons as different, inferior, unequal, and disfavored. It says to them, your relationship is not the same and it's less approved than those enjoyed by opposite-sex couples. It stigmatizes gay and les gays and lesbians. It classifies them as outcasts. It causes needless and unrelenting pain and isolation and humiliation. We have courts to declare enactments like Proposition 8 that take our citizens are worthy, loving, upstanding citizens who are being treatedly and being hurt every single day. We have courts to declare those measures unconstitutional and that is why we are here today. Very well, thank you Mr. Olson. Ms. Stewart, very briefly, your intervention is um, with respect to the impact of Proposition 8 on uh, cities and counties in the state, municipalities. Uh, what's the evidence going to show in this regard? Mr. Olson spoke eloquently about the California Supreme Court's statement that denying marriage um, and relegating same-sex couples to a different institution labels them second class, sends the message that they're second class. And what you'll hear in this case is evidence about the deep links between Proposition 8 and the prejudice that tells gay men and lesbians and their families that they're inferior. Um, Proposition 8 both springs from prejudice. Well, I'm interested in the issue on which you've been permitted to intervene, and that is uh, reflected in one of the plaintiff's proposed findings uh, that um, recognizing same-sex marriage would produce a $3 billion surplus for California. What's the evidence on that? Your Honor, the evidence of the economic effects of, the, of Proposition 8 um, will come both in the form of admissions and uh, uh, discovery that we've gotten from the state itself, as well as testimony that you're going to hear from economic experts. 
Um, it's also going to come from testimony about some of the direct effects of the prejudice that um, happened during the Proposition 8 campaign and that um, reaches back to earlier prejudice that Mr. Olson alluded to. Uh, I want to briefly touch on what that evidence will show and then on the, its effects. Um, against the, the backdrop, I think Mr. Olson mentioned, and I won't go back, about the history of discrimination and the demonization of gay people. And it was against this backdrop that Proposition 8's proponents carefully calibrated their campaign to evoke messages that Americans have heard many times before. Messages that gay relationships are inferior, that they're immoral, and that the gay agenda will have dire consequences for non-gay people and especially for children. We heard in the campaign, and the court will hear evidence, that there is a culturally triumphant homosexual movement that will have poses a grave threat to children. It will hear that evidence that the campaign said gay relationships are not the same as marriage and that gay relationships can only imitate heterosexual relationships. That gay relationships are, that gay lives are a sin and that- Let's get back to the economics. The, the denial but, of marriage, of course, where, is one where, of those- Where is the link between the denial of same-sex marriage and injury to a municipality in the state of California? First of all, Your Honor, you're, you will hear that this prejudice has caused hate crimes in the state of California. Oh, hate, cri hate crimes. Um, that prejudice and treating gay people as inferior has caused hate crimes that are occurring at an alarming rate for as long as the government has kept statistics. You'll hear about a San Diego man who was beaten nearly to death in 2006. You'll hear about a 15-year-old boy who was shot and killed in Oxnard, California late last year by another boy because of his sexual orientation. You'll hear about the costs that those hate crimes impose on the government. What's the link to Proposition 8? Well, Your Honor, you, you, I was trying to talk about that link, um, and, and so let me shift back to that. Proposition 8 taught that gay people's lives are a sin, that they can't be compared to the skin of racial minorities, that it's one thing for the majority to tolerate those relationships, but that they can't be recognized or celebrated, that being gay is a lifestyle that can and should be changed. It reinforced messages that our historian will talk about that have been played over and over again in American history about the inferiority of gay people and about how immoral and sinful a people they are. That message leads to hate crimes, Your Honor, and we will show that link. And that hate crimes based on sexual orientation not only harm the victims in a huge way, but harm the government who has to investigate and prosecute those hate crimes and spend a great deal of money to do that. You'll hear about a boy who was emotionally and physically abused by his parents when they learned that he was gay, by so-called therapists who tried to convert him into a heterosexual, starting when he was only 14 years old. You'll hear about how he dropped out of school, how he left home, how he sought refuge with the juvenile dependency system and relied on public hospitals for health care that he couldn't afford. You'll hear that he almost, he, he suffered depression, and self-destructive behavior and came close to throwing his lives away. The consequences of that abuse were not borne by that young man alone, although he bore them most heavily. The human and economic costs were also borne by the government, the juvenile dependency system, the hospitals, and the other social services. You'll also hear about people whose employers grant health care coverage to the spouses of their married employees, but refuse to provide that coverage to the domestic partners of their lesbian and gay employees. Healthcare coverage, when it's denied, either because a young man leaves his home for persecution by his family or because the employers uh, of a person in a same-sex relationship will not provide coverage to their domestic partner, that healthcare coverage has to be provided by someone, and county governments are the health care provider of last resort. Last year, Cal San Francisco spent $177 million on health services for the uninsured. It is very difficult to prove exactly how much of that amount is related to discrimination, but we know that it is a significant amount. And even a small fraction of that amount means millions of taxpayer dollars that could have been spent for something other than discrimination. The evidence will also show that when lesbians and gay men suffer from psychological distress due to the discrimination and the stigmatization that they face every single day, governments not only spend money to provide necessary services for them in a general way, but also must develop special programs to reach out to them and to ensure that they come and that they get treated. 
As I mentioned, when hate crimes take place, the government spends money to investigate them, to prosecute them. Those costs are hard to track, but even more difficult to track is the cost to the victims themselves and to the businesses and to the government that result when victims' injuries reduce their productivity or when their fear keeps them from traveling or from socializing even at the restaurants and cafes in their own neighborhood. When couples cannot get married and celebrate their marriages in their communities, they're denied many of the tangible and intangible benefits that our experts will tell you marriage brings. Their loss is also the community's loss. Lower tax revenues and higher social service costs are borne by the whole community. The community also loses the economic activity and tax revenue that comes from weddings. The Proposition 8 proponents are going to tell you that all is well in California and America, that these instances of discrimination no longer occur and that they're banned by law and in any event are rare, that hostility and prejudice are products of a past era. Tell that to the man who almost lost his life in 2006. Tell it to the family of the young boy who was murdered in, San, in, in Oxnard. Tell it to the men and women who serve their country in uniform to be discharged and stigmatized because they can no longer hide their lives and their loved ones from their fellow soldiers. Tell it to the people in Arkansas who can't adopt and tell it to the children who cannot be placed in homes because there aren't enough homes to place them in. And tell it to the plaintiffs who sit before you today unable to participate in this most important relationship of adult life. Proposition 8 comes from and perpetuates a prejudice and it's a prejudice that society not only can't tolerate but it can't afford. Proposition 8 cannot stand. Very well, thank you Ms. Stewart. Um, before turning to Mr. Cooper, let me see, does the governor have anything that he wants to make by way of an opening statement? The governor uh, counsel will not make an opening statement. Very well. How about the attorney general? I have a question for the attorney general. <laughs> if Proposition 8 violates the United States Constitution, the position which the attorney general is taking now, how did it wind up on the ballot? No, isn't, the, isn't the Attorney General supposed to review these measures beforehand? And if a, an initiative measure is in violation of the Constitution, isn't the Attorney General duty bound to, to uh, prevent it from being placed before the voters? No, Your Honor, I don't believe that's true under California law. The Attorney General's responsibility is to draft a title and summary that describes the initiative for the purpose of collecting signatures. I have a brief on this. Pardon me? I have a brief on this. On you, say that you say the Attorney General has no duty or responsibility to review an initiative measure for its constitutionality or its unconstitutionality before being placed before the voters. That's right, Your Honor. There are provisions in the law for challenging, in advance of putting it on the ballot, a uh, ballot initiative. Most of those are generally uh, not decided in advance of the election uh, under prevailing precedent in California law. But we're, we're happy to present well, a brief. I was, as a lawyer, I was involved in uh, a pre-election challenge to an initiative measure. Yes. I'm sorry, I think I missed. And you say the Attorney General has no responsibility to uh, review an initiative measure for its constitutionality? Not under the law of the initiative process in California, Your Honor, no. The Attorney General does not have the authority under state law to determine what the law is. That in, under California law as well as under federal law is the province of the courts. Attorney General take a position on Proposition 8 prior to the election? Your Honor, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do not believe so. Only after this lawsuit was filed that he took that position. Is that correct? Your Honor, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. It would be helpful Council, if you could explore these issues and at an appropriate time submit, uh, uh, submit the answers. 
We would be happy to do that, Your Honor. Very well. I'll appreciate that. Very well. Mr. Cooper. <clears throat> Good morning again, Chief Judge Walker, and may it please the court. <clears throat> On November 4th, 2008, 14 million Californians went to the polls to cast their ballots on an issue of overriding social and cultural